All right, what do you say, everybody? Cubs Baseball Channel back at you. Chuck Walter, Mick Gillespie, another little rapid-fire podcast. We had the most successful night in the channel's history. Incepted just a month ago or so. It was an idea, and now we're having a Joe Madden's Try Not to Suck beverage as we celebrate a night where we got 100 subscribers over the course of just a few hours. Wow. Yeah, it looks delicious. Uh, me, I'm in a hotel here in Kingsport, Tennessee, where I just hosted an event with Daryl Strawberry for the uh, MLB's Appy League All-Stars. So I don't have one of those beers here, and you can tell this is a hotel room. That's why don't why you I'm raid here. the pantry, get yourself a $15 Dude, bag of some Smart Pop? I would, but you, I, you, we got to do the show, and you keep popping off and doing other stuff. So I, you're, you're keeping me from my cold beers. No doubt about it. All right, so Let's the good go. thing... The good thing about getting the subscribers is welcome to all of you that just joined the page. The bad thing about getting the subscribers is there were a lot of negative comments directed towards the guy in the hat. Uh, you don't have the hat on today, so you don't have to claim that. It was Mick Gillespie, though, who made some of those takes. So we'll get into it in just a moment. Let's start it off nice and easy. Kyle Hendricks, is this his last start for the Chicago Cubs? It's a yes or it's a no? <laughs> I think it may be, you know, like, and I guess the Cubs are going to have to find a partner. But, you know, if you go sell, he's a player that another team would want. I mean, can you imagine him going somewhere like Baltimore to give that young Orioles team that is so good the experience of having a guy that's been through a playoff and a World Series champion and pitching in game seven and all the stuff that he brings to the table? Uh, you know, sadly, it would be awful to have the last guy from 2016 that was on the Cubs World Series champion team not with the Cubs anymore I mean there's just something comforting about having a guy who was there when the curse was lifted when we finally you know beat the billy goat down uh with another franchise but it, there were a lot of rumors that he was going to be traded last year and of course he had the injury and um yeah I I could see him being someone that would get a pretty good price and where the Cubs are right now, I don't know. I just, I just don't think that he's what they're looking at long term. Sorry. You mentioned Baltimore. Um, it's interesting because the Orioles have a third base prospect and, and Kobe Mayo, who's blocked by big leaguers, who's blocked by better prospects in the system. Basically, Kobe Mayo could potentially be available if you wanted to flip Kyle Hendricks. And what's so intriguing about Hendricks to other teams right now is not only is he really solid with an ERA under 3-4 right now, and has had three quality starts in his last five games, you get control of him next year. He's got that club option for $16 million. So if you like what Kyle Hendricks brings to the table for your squad next year, then basically you have a year and a half, and he's not your typical rental, which can net you a little bit more. So it begs the question, what can he net you? I look at a team like the Arizona Diamondbacks that have Zach Gallen, that have Merrill Kelly. He could be a great number three could Kyle Hendricks on that team. Diamondbacks also have two pitchers in AAA having decent success that are top five prospects in their system. I'm looking at the fifth prospect, Blake Walston. He's touched down in AAA, a 6'5 lefty with room to get a lot better. And I'm also looking at A.J. Vukovic, big right-handed power bat, was a finalist for uh, Mr. Wisconsin in basketball. So he already is a Midwest guy, knows the area. <laughs> and he is projected to potentially be a big league third baseman, which is something the Cubs are looking for right now. Yeah, remember, the Cubs traded Ryan Dempster to the Rangers to get Kyle Hendricks, you know, and that was uh, back when people didn't want to see Demp go, you know, because we love Demp, and, you know, he was going to help the Rangers make a run, and now we're kind of at the other end of this with Kyle Hendricks, and, you know, you're talking about some prospects. I think that the Cubs – would really want to get back a young pitcher that could start for them because that's where they need help. That's where the big team, that's where the teams win championships with starting pitching. And we saw that with, you know, Kyle Hendricks. I mean, he was on a staff where he was like the fifth guy, you know, back in 2016. And then by the end of the season, he was one of the most reliable options that the Cubs had, you know. Uh, and, and so maybe going somewhere else, not only do you have him and where he slots in the rotation, but he's one of the smartest baseball players I've ever been around. You know, like it's next level knowledge of the game, the, the way that he is able to uh, break down batters. It doesn't necessarily mean that, hey, I just watch a lot of video. 
It's his ability to watch video, watch the game at a live pace, and then uh, you know dig in there and figure out weaknesses with hitters, and that's going to help all of the pitchers, plus the confidence that this guy has. He's always been really quiet and confident. He, he's not a big talker, but he's actually uh, you know follow my lead type of guy. So those teams that are hoping, especially the young teams that are contending right now, there's the, the Rangers, uh, the Orioles. You know, those are teams that Diamondbacks you mentioned that are young and they really think that they have a chance. Hendricks could be someone that you get, you put in your rotation, and not only does he help you by pitching, maybe he's your, your third guy, but he also helps the other guys by just the experience that he has. You know, he was a guy that a lot of people did not have on the prospect list, or he was down the line, you know, but when you looked at his stats as a minor leaguer, he'd have like a hundred and some uh, strikeouts and like 10 walks, right? So that's what I'm saying, like his ability... To it just kept on getting better and better as he as he went up the system. And so the Cubs, it's up to them and their scouts to go out there and find the next Kyle Hendricks. If you trade Kyle Hendricks, you know, and maybe it's a hard-throwing guy. Maybe it's somebody that just has amazing command. But you're right. You know, I, I, I know where you're going with this. You're saying, hey, if, if they're just going to give you some, you know, back-end prospect, why not keep him? Yeah, I mean, you have to know his worth at the end of the day. And his worth is... He's a really good big league pitcher right now, and I think he's a number three in, in pretty much any rotation throughout baseball, aside from maybe two or three organizations. Kyle Hendricks, your favorite moment or your favorite quality about him as a player? Because you've known Kyle since, I guess, his early 20s, right? Yeah. Well, my favorite – I got a couple. Okay, my favorite – one of my favorite moments with him – I'm going to give you a few. First off – the, the he was pitching for the Smokies and of course I'm their broadcaster and I'm watching this team uh the Barons had a guy that was like you know I don't know almost 30 years old and he's in the league and he's hitting all these home runs and and you're like why is he in the league you know like what, what are we what are the White Sox doing with this guy he should be in the big leagues and then all of a sudden you know, you, you, somebody threw him an inside changeup and I mean he he almost broke his neck trying to hit it and I'm like okay and then, and so I, t so I talked to, you know, Kyle and I'm like, you know, everyone else is getting bombed by this guy and he's not. And I'm like, do they not see that the guy can't hit the, in, the this inside change up? And he's like, I, he goes, man, I think the same thing. Like, I, I don't know. And, and, you know, you start, and this is just, just a kid, you know, just a 20 year old. And so I see him at Starbucks in Jackson, Tennessee before a game one day and he's, he's there. And I said, Hey, um, you know, you're going to be in the big leagues. You're going to be pretty good. And he just kind of had this look like, thanks, man. You know, like, and I'm like, no, I'm serious. I'm not just telling you that as Charlie takes a swig. You, know, you could see it all coming together. And so uh, his dad's a great guy. I saw his dad, I think it's spring training, and he's fighting for a spot. And I said, uh, I said, you know, one day he's going to be the opening day starter. And his dad's like, hey, we're just let's just get him into the, you know, like one of the top five spots, you know. But I've always had that kind of belief in him. And it's because I don't think that you have to overpower a batter to get him out. I don't think that I, I'm not so driven on these analytics that tell me that, oh, you know, we got to strike everybody out. And that's all it is. Look, you, there's pitch to contact. There's guys who, who can mix it up. There's guys that work against your strength, your strengths and your weaknesses. And he's one of those guys. He's special. Um, he I remember one bullpen he threw and and one of the other guys that was in the pitching staff was talking about his bullpens and he throw 30 pitches and miss with two of them. And I said, you know, it was a guy named Eric Jokic. And I'm like, is that not normal? And he's like, no. That's not normal. That's not normal. Like, he just doesn't miss, you know. So that's my favorite. Those are some of my favorite stories about him, you know, as a, as a person. But my, my favorite story about him, my favorite moment of, of his is just that World Series Game 7, you know, where he, he just came in there and, and was so good. And I'm like, when Joe Madden and, you know, try not to suck beer behind you, when he came and took him out of the game, I'm like, what? are you doing you know just like, just he was mowing down the indians like they had no chance in that game and you know how it turned out you know it's just it, it didn't have to be the seesaw that it was but we got rings so i'm happy uh but i'll never forget that man and it, there's just a just a kid out there on the mound he's so competitive and he's the last of the 2016 cubs i, I love him i would honestly hate to see him go i would love to see him finish out 
next season as a Cub. Pick up that option for $16 million. See what he can do for your squad next year. But I get it. At the end of the day, it's a business decision. If you get the right offer, you have to take it. Maybe you throw an offer to the uh, Tampa Bay Rays who have Curtis Mead, a third base prospect who's, who's top five right now, is already in AAA, hitting pretty well for the Durham Bulls, and maybe he could be your starting third baseman next year, and you make that swap there. It's all about position of needs at this point, but you mentioned starting position or, or starting pitching is a position of need, and Kyle Hendricks would help this team next year. So would it be wise to dish him right now? Weigh the pros and the cons for me. Look, I mean, I... I, I, I guess you, 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 as much as I hate to say it, I guess you, you really got to take serious any trade opportunities here, you know. And so the pros are you, you get a starting pitcher um, or maybe you get a catcher. As I think the, the, the Cubs system right now needs some more catchers. I think the Cubs need the catcher of the future. So maybe, you know, I, even though I think you get pitching, when you give up pitching, you want to get pitching back. This was a draft that didn't have a lot of pitching in it. So, you know, maybe you, you do that. The, the, the pros of trading them is that you expect to get something back that's going to help you. And you look at the system right now and the guys that are up and coming, you know, these are all guys that were traded. And, you know, so th there's a wave of players that are going to be pushing and knocking on the door probably by spring training. So that that'd be the pro. The con is that, you know, he's still got juice in the tank. And you're this is a business, right? You want to have a face that you can sell. And, and there are, I mean, look, every time you watch the Marquee Sports Network, they always have a 2016 special on. I mean, like, it's constant. I mean, you can't get away from it. And I get it. Look, man, I mean, they, it's the only World Series the team has won since the, you know, since 1907 and 08 or whatever, you know, but it's just cool having that last guy there. And I guess you could say, well, David Ross, you know, the manager. So, yeah, those two guys, but the last player is Hendricks. All right, now's the time where I tell everyone to like, subscribe, and if we've said something dumb so far, <laughs> you get your keyboard ready and you tell us how stupid we are for saying something. This is my favorite part of the show, Mick, because now that we've formed a little community and the, the algorithm is going to pop this show back up on people's timelines that have already watched, we can respond to some of the viewer comments, negative and positive, that they provided us, and we can just really... Pick our battles here. We can uh, we can fight back with our pitchforks, or we could throw our hands into the sky and say, you win. I'm an absolute idiot. And the best part about this is no one came at me because I'm just the, me I'm just the driver here. Uh, well, first one to the fella on the left. Look up Bonds' stats in the postseason before the drugs. He was a huge underperformer in the playoffs. I saw it. It was a topic all over the radio. A choker he was named, and I was living in Pittsburgh. We're going to look at someone when he was 23 years old and the production that he had. Look at Barry Bonds and what he was doing at age 39. He had an OPS above, I believe it was above 1,400. He was the most unstoppable player of any era ever. I know you say Babe Ruth, but guess what? I'm taking a player that did not drink a pint of bourbon and ginger ale for breakfast because that doesn't fly in today's day and age. Steroids or not, Barry Bonds was still a fantastic player. And quite frankly, there should be an asterisk. There should be a, uh, you know, a hall of shame in the hall of fame. So when I take my kids someday, I can explain to them, Hey, this is Barry Bonds. One of the greatest, if not the greatest player ever, but here's what he did and explain to him instead of Barry Bonds, history being erased as we move forward. Look, man, there's this movie called Rocky IV. And I loved all the Rockies. I still love the Rockies. I watch the Creeds, and if they make a Drago movie, I'm going to watch that too. I have never missed a Rocky movie. And Rocky IV was Rocky, and he's fighting the, the Russian that's all pumped up on steroids, right? And the American <laughs> way is, like, you do, it, you do it right. You know, you don't cheat. You know, like, you know, it, this guy's, like, pumping and riding on a bike, and Rocky's just out in, you know, in, in the, the, the frozen tundra out there in Siberia and he's like punching meat and running through snow and all that stuff. My point is this, is that Barry Bonds was Drago. You know, he's the one that was the, the cheater. You know, he's the one that went out there and, and, and took the short route and he's a great player and his stats are definitely unrivaled. 
but to me, they're just not legitimate. I agree with exactly with that comment. Uh, I saw the guy, and I, I said, I'll say it again. I was out there for a Dodgers Giants series at Old Candlestick Park. Barry Bonds was like 195 pounds, and then the next time you, you know, I saw him, he was like 240, and it was all muscle, and his head got real big. And and the other thing about him too, and this shouldn't matter. But I've heard from people that played with him that he was a jerk. He just wasn't a good guy. Like he's he, he it was yeah, always about him. And I, you know what? And, and that matters to me. I mean, you can treat people the right way. That's easy to do. And maybe maybe it was the steroids or whatever. But forget that guy. I agree. I think the Hall of Fame, in my opinion, though, should be a place. It's a history museum. At the end of the day, if if everything burnt down, if if Guy Montag came out and went Fahrenheit 451 and burnt all the books, and the only thing you had standing there was the Hall of Fame, we wouldn't be able to, you know, explain. I mean, we we could explain, but we wouldn't be able to show who Barry Bonds was to our children. And that's why I think there should be the asterisk alley. How about that? The asterisk alley at the Hall of Fame in Cooperstown that basically just has all the players that uh, have cheated over the years, but you can ex- still explain the stories themselves. 69 M O J O E Z says a catching <laughs> prospect. Do you guys even watch the Cubs? They need a third baseman prospects, prospects, prospects. We don't want to hear it. Someone else said the Cubs need help on the, on the hot corner. They also need a first baseman. This team can't hit whatsoever. What does a catching prospect do when you already have Miguel Amaya, who some believe is the catcher of the future? How do you respond to that one? Well, look, I mean, I see Christopher Morrell hitting in the big leagues, and he's he's got an ability to play third. I mean, I know he's got work to do. Trust me, I know. I mean, I was shocked when they sent him to the big leagues last year. I knew he could hit, but, you know, w- w- was he ready to play every day and – play you know clean MLB mystique mistake free baseball no so he's out there learning on the job you got Jake Slaughter third base in AAA the guy's driving in a ton of runs he's hitting home runs uh defensively could be a little better but he's working on that he's improving um and this guy you know he looks like a linebacker playing third base Matt Mervis another guy you know he he's he's killing it at AAA he struggled a little bit in the big leagues in his first st- stint, but so did Anthony Rizzo, you know? So, I mean, you, you throw those guys up there and then, and then let them do their thing. You know, the, another guy in double a right now, Hayden McGarry, I hosted the, uh, Appalachian league all-star game gala today. And, uh, he was here last year, which is like college wood bat league guys. And now he's in double a and he's got this amazing exit velocity off of his bat. He's got a lot of work defensively to do, but he's converting to catcher to first base. But I mean, it's, he's a prospect. I mean, like he's, he is a prospect. I just look at catching and I'm just not sold on Miguel Amaya. I think he's an okay player. Pablo Aliendo, another guy, I mean, I think is okay, but I'm saying if you could go out and get like a superstar catcher, you gave up one. You, you 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 need to get another one, but yeah, I mean that the corners and behind the plate and starting pitching to me are the biggest holes that they have. The the last thing I wanted to give everyone is just a taste of what's coming. September call ups are soon. Who do the Cubs have that you think is really going to shine when they get their moment? Well, you know what? I mean, the, the thing about September call-ups, which is so different now, it used to be that in September you just unloaded the minor league talent, and, and now it's like a couple guys, you know? I'm not I, – I, it's so hard for me to figure out exactly what the front office is doing anymore. You know, like I, I, I wouldn't think that Miles Masterboni would be a big leaguer all the time, but he is, and then I would think that, you know, you would give a shot to a guy named – Darius Hill, who led the minor leagues in hits last year, and they tell me that they don't like his swing. You know, I I, I just don't know. I mean, uh, I would think that you, if Alexander Canario is healthy, he's the guy you got for Chris Bryant, one of them anyway, from the Giants. Um, He's just coming back. You know, maybe you get him to the big leagues. He was right on the doorstep last year. Uh, I'm not sure about Pete Crow Armstrong. I still think he's got some stuff to do. He needs to hit the ball the, the other side of the field. He needs to bunt and walk a little bit. You know, these are weaknesses that'll be a, that'll be attacked at the big league level. But he's on the way, and I mean, he's going to be a great star for the Cubs in the near future. You know, but maybe him, um, maybe Jake Slaughter. Maybe you give him a chance. Matt Mervis, definitely. I mean, I think you got to put Mervis in the big leagues again at some point and let him grind it out. And a lot of this depends on, you know what they do in the trade deadline too you know i mean if it's the trade deadline's coming up if if they stay put 
you know, then it, it, there's probably going to be a lot less movement in, in September. If they go and make a bunch of trades, then guess what? You're going to see, you know, the guys that would have been called up in September called up in August, and we're going to we're going to kind of throw them out there and uh, and try to, um, you know, go ahead and you know grind it out and and see if we got any players. All right, I'm a little jealous that everyone's calling you an idiot in the comments and I haven't gotten anything <laughs> one way or the other. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to finish with a take here. And it, it, it's simple to me. I think you sell Kyle Hendricks. I think you see what you can get back. Some, some prospects that are maybe diamonds in the rough and try to get multiple prospects. Position player and a couple of pitchers. I think you sell Marcus Stroman to the Diamondbacks or the Rays for a position player. And I think you extend Cody Bellinger. I, I really do. I said it yesterday on the show. You're just not going to get anything better than Cody Bellinger. When going, when healthy, when hot, when he's Cody Bellinger, which he clearly is right now, and I think he can be for the next four or five years if he stays healthy, there's no one in the game that's significantly better than Cody Bellinger. Like, he's your guy. You have him in-house. He says he wants to be here. Give him the check. Make him say no. That's all I'm saying. How many years would you go? You know, like how big of a deal? You know, I mean, that's, I guess. It, it's, five. I think right, five's the magic it's, number. It's so hard for us to see. He's going to want eight, right? Yeah. I mean, like they just signed uh, Dansby Swanson to seven years. I mean, do you really think that Dansby Swanson five years from now is going to be legit starting shortstop in the big leagues? We'll see. I mean, I mean, that's the question. I mean, it's, but you're going to be paying him to be one. So, and then they went and drafted all these shortstops in this year's draft, right? And I know you can move shortstops to other positions. So, is he going to end up at second base? Is he going to play the outfield? I mean, I don't know. You know, it's like these deals are just, I, I, I'm telling you, they, look at the Padres, you know, like just because you go out and get all these big name guys doesn't mean that you're going to win. The, the teams that are winning now, you know, some of them are teams like that, like the Dodgers, they have a really good balance of going out and signing guys. And then also developing players and even making some trades sometimes for younger guys. So just going out and paying people doesn't always work. But Cody Bellinger, you know, if you could get him on the right deal, I'm not opposed to that. I mean, no, I, he, I, just, I agree with you. I mean, I think he's a really good player. I mean, and, but he's a former MVP and he looks like that now. They need their cornerstone and I think they have him in house. So do everything you can to lock him up. You have Bellinger, you have Swanson. You have Hap, you have Suzuki, get Nico Horner on board. You have five, six guys in the lineup that you can really work around. Add your rotation through trades, bring guys up through the minor leagues. That 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 brings me to this. Ben Brown, Jordan Wicks, are they September call-ups or is this next year? Uh, yes, they are September call-ups. Uh, ben Brown is is just about ready to go. But the thing you don't want to do is 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 rush these guys, and then they get ripped up in the big leagues, and then they lose confidence, and then all of a sudden now they're no good anymore. You know, and then you're trying to that happens a lot. Yeah, right. It's happened with the Cubs too. You know, so um, you know, it's the same thing with the position players with the pitching. You know, put them in a spot where they can succeed. You know, don't get them, you know, mentally messed up because they're going to fail. I mean, honestly, the, the truth of the matter is, is that they're going to go to the big leagues and they're going to get hit hard because it's the big leagues and they're the best ever. But it's how they adjust their game. So, yeah, I think Ben Brown will probably have more success early than Jordan Wicks because of his ability to strike out batters, which is something that he's done at, uh, you know, just a breakneck pace this year. But Jordan Wicks, who struggled last year in Double A, kind of started figuring it out this year. He's in Triple A and he's doing well. The thing with him is when he's just got to get into the mode of always hitting that first pitch strike, first or second pitch strike, which is something that big league starters do. And when he's ahead of the batters, he is just so tough to hit. 